make out. Um, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't able to do a video earlier in the week, but I was a little, a little busy. Welcome. It's almost Mother's Day, so don't forget to reach out to your mom if your mom's still around, if you have a good relationship, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I've been a little busy. I've, there's a lot of stuff that went on kind of last weekend and why I couldn't really do a video earlier in the week. My daughter graduated. Thank you for to everybody for reaching out. Yeah, so I spent most of the weekend with her. She's awesome and I'm so proud of her. And yes, oh my God, like I have a kid now who actually just graduated from college and it's really kind of crazy. I have to make sure I have my coffee bean too. Don't go anywhere without it. Let's talk a little bit about Star Wars. Peter Mayhew, who um, some of you may know, played Chewbacca in most of the movies, passed away. And it was really kind of sad because even though you never really see his face on the screen, like his presence is, is sorely missed. And he's totally humble and he loves his fans and stuff like that. So Peter Mayhew, thank you for all you've, you've given us, especially us big Star Wars fans. We, you will be missed. So let's get to the meat of some of this stuff. And these are gonna be massive spoilers. So I'm gonna talk about two things specifically. The first one is Game of Thrones, season eight, episode four. Okay, so a lot of stuff went on in this episode and I've heard a lot of complaints. Oh, and there might have been a, a coffee or two that snuck in to the episode. Let's talk a little bit about the episode. The previous one uh, dealt with the White Walkers and Arya taking out the, the Night King, which I really liked. This one is kind of a mixed bag and there's been a lot of complaints about it from a pacing standpoint, from a story standpoint, from characters making weird decisions. I just think personally what happened was is that they crammed too much into one episode. And I kind of think they needed to draw it out into two episodes for so, some of the things to really like play out the way they, they normally would in previous seasons. Case in point, the Jamie and Breen relationship thing, even though it's playing on the screen over the course of like 10 minutes, it's kind of weirdly implied that, that they had been, they, they've been sleeping together for months. And I know that sounds weird, and that's why a lot of people are having an issue with it because in previous seasons, these characters took months and months and months to get around to different parts of Westeros. And then all of a sudden in this one episode, they're all quickly in different locations that took them months in previous seasons, but yet we cut back to Jamie and Breen and they're in bed together. So it's like, it's a, it's weird because it's like, it doesn't seem like they're together that long. And so when Jamie basically leaves Winterfell and leaves Breen behind, Breen like totally breaks down and starts crying. And, and you're kind of going, what, what, why? Why is, why is she so sad? Because they only slept together maybe once or twice, but I think it's just implied they were supposed to, they were actually together longer than that and they respect each other. So that was kind of strange. Arya turning down Gendry, which I'm kind of glad actually, because I didn't think it was in her character to want to be a lady. And so I'm kind of glad that Arya went off with the Hound, which I love, I always loved that duo and what they're gonna do, which I'm assuming is confront the mountain. And we'll see what Arya does when she gets into King's Landing. We lost Rhaegar, the green dragon, which a lot of people, again, were kind of upset about that it happens so quickly. And especially with dragons that were supposed to be so indestructible. I didn't mind it so much because they kind of set it up that this was eventually gonna happen. And I liked the idea that Sansa kept telling Danny, our people need to rest. And Danny's like, no, I wanna go now. And then you see her dragons flying and Drogon, you know, he seems to be fine, but it's Rhaegar who's like, you see the big hole in his wing and he's like, I can't fly too well. And he looked like he was hurt and he didn't quite heal. And I think um, at one point Tyrion or Varys says something, he doesn't look so great, like he needed time to heal or rest. And right after that is when he gets taken down by Euron, who's a crazy psychopath. But anyway, talking about Tyrion and Varys, I loved that scene with the two of them where all of a sudden you start to realize like, ooh, Varys actually isn't on board with Danny anymore. And and I kind of wonder in the back of my mind, is he a mole? Like, has he been a mole? Because for the past couple seasons, since Danny's gotten to Westeros, I, I keep scratching my head going like, wait a second, how does like Cersei and, and her army, like they always know where Danny is. And I'm wondering if Varys is gonna try to take Danny out and, and if Tyrion's gonna be smart enough to see that coming because he kind of got a hint. Then we had the soap opera that I call the Jon Snow and Danny show. There's the secret, right? 
right? That John is a Targaryen, Aegon Targaryen. And Danny asks him to keep it a secret because she's afraid that it's going to completely destroy them. And she wants the throne to herself. And John's like, well, no, I can't do that, basically. And he goes to tell Sansa and, and Arya and, and basically says, you know, you need to keep this a secret. And of course, Sansa can't. And it gets out there. So <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see if this one secret is going to completely destroy the relationship between John and Danny and how that plays out. My theory is, you want to hear my theory? My theory is, and it's been like this for a while now, I think no one's going to take the throne. And I think the idea is that like some of our main characters are going to die. And I think we're going to end up with Tyrion and a couple other lead people basically going, you know, it's the throne that's caused all of this. And... Danny wanted to break the wheel, so why don't we break the wheel and just get rid of it and not even do this whole like one one ruler, one leader. Let's do more like a democracy kind of thing and, and we'll, we'll, rule, we'll rule pockets of it together. That's my theory. I think Tyrion's gonna be a part of that and I think that Arya is gonna go off on her own little adventure and explore the West Western world, the unexplored world. Anyway, we have two more episodes left. Episode five is this Sunday, so hopefully I will be recapping and talking a little bit about that. Ghost. Come on, John. All you had to do is go up and pet your wolf or hug him. He looks so sad. John's just like, go with Tormund up north. That's where you belong. Oh, come on, John. No, 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 no. All right, so the next thing up is Avengers Endgame. And I actually got a couple questions asking me about this. And I actually went out to see it. You're all in shock right now, right? I know. I'm going to give you a moment to, to take a breath. I know you're all hyperventilating that Miss Mako actually went out and saw Avengers Endgame in the movie theaters. Okay, are you good? You good, everybody? Okay, here we go. I'm just gonna dive in. You know how I feel about superhero movies, right? I didn't really like it. Some of the people I've talked to about it are just like, what, you didn't like Endgame? And I was like, yeah, I, I'm i sorry, I didn't like it. I, there was too many problems in it for me. And I'll list them off, but first before I do that, I'm gonna list the things I actually did like. I really liked the way the movie opened. Like I, I loved the Hawkeye scene with his family and then all of a sudden turning to realize they're gone. That was really emotional and I loved bringing Hawkeye back into it because I missed him in Infinity War. And I gotta admit, like Iron Man to me had the the best storyline and he went out obviously as a hero and I liked that part of it I liked the sacrifice I liked where he started I liked how the journey that he had I loved when he met his dad and you know that he had a daughter and he loved his daughter all the way up until the final he puts the gauntlet on his hand or the infinity stones it's not the gauntlet but the infinity stones I guess got captured or put under his hand I, I did like that I actually did I thought that was pretty well done I thought it was a little too easy for him to kind of get the stones in a way. It seemed a little convenient, but it happened and it worked and there. I kind of liked uh, Nebula, who is a character I usually don't like. I thought they did a really interesting thing with her character and how she kind of has to face herself when she was the bad version of her. And I found that kind of intriguing. I thought that was kind of cool and how they dealt with her whole story and her situation. And even still Hawkeye, like for the most part, I liked Hawkeye, except when I get to one section, but I, I do like Hawkeye through a lot of it. That's kind of it, guys. I'm, I'm sorry to say like I had a hard time with most of the rest of the movie and especially when you talk about like these there's 22 movies right that are 21 movies or I don't know how many that lead up to this one particular one I kind of had a problem with Endgame I enjoyed Infinity War way more than I did Endgame so let me talk about the things that I didn't like about it number one I thought it was incredibly messy in terms of pacing in terms of just storytelling I felt like some things were rushed some things went on too long while I did like the heist aspect of the storyline splitting up and stuff like that at times it got to be confusing to me and maybe it's because there was too much reliance on knowing the comic and other things about the characters but it just felt kind of messy to me it didn't feel cohesive and then all of a sudden once again we get into act three and I've been complaining about this for years. Act three is a bunch of CG armies, villains battling the good guys and it's exactly the same thing and I'm like I'm literally sitting there in the theater going 
Okay, how many times have I seen this already? This, and this brings me to my next point, the stakes of these movies. That kind of scenario happens so often in these, these movies, these superhero movies, and especially Marvel movies, that the stakes don't feel real anymore. Like they're not honest to me. So when I see these villain CG armies, like I'm just like, oh, well, it's nothing new that we haven't already seen. And it's like, villains are gonna get destroyed. The villains are whatever, the heroes are gonna win for the most part. And then the second thing about honest stakes is the whole thing about death. So. Endgame was very confusing for me, and I'm a very complicated woman. They're going into the past to try to bring back most of their friends and like half, I guess half the population of the world. So that basically means death doesn't mean as much. And then yet then we have some of our main characters die, like Black Widow and Iron Man. And yet that's supposed to mean a lot and that we can't go back and do anything about that. So the, the cheating aspect of the time travel stuff really actually bothered me. I thought it was a big cheat. The stakes lessened for me and the deaths lessened for me. It felt cheap to me. I don't know if there was any other way to get around that. And I'm pretty sure that was always a part of the comic book storyline. I really liked Thanos in Infinity War. I thought he was a super interesting character that they dove into. And then he just became a kind of like two dimensional character in, in Endgame. There were so many things about Endgame that the characters made decisions and did things that I don't think necessarily always lined up. And another one for me was Black Widow. So Black Widow makes a massive, like at least Iron Man, Tony Stark makes a sacrifice that makes sense to me. Black Widow doesn't. When I looked back at all the different films that she's in, her character and, and the arcs and things that she's going through, this kind of came out of left field for me. Like, I'm like, I didn't understand like what, why is she, what, how did she get to such a place that she's doing this? Especially because throughout the Marvel films, they've set up her relationship with Bruce Banner, that she seems really, really tight with Bruce, right? And the Hulk and calming him down and all that kind of stuff that every, time they were together, it seemed like they were building some kind of bond. And then that just completely goes away. Even though Black Widow and Bruce are still alive at the beginning of the movie. That didn't make any sense to me. And I didn't like her death. It just, it didn't make sense to me. And then, and because of that, it seemed like it was a female, like one of your only lead female characters gets killed off only to service the motivation of the male characters. Cause it's the male characters that kind of get riled up. Right. And like, they, oh, oh, you know, because of this, we have to then go kick butt and, and and stuff so it was just like mm. it, it left a little bit of bad taste in my mouth I have to say especially as a woman Captain America this is another part I had a problem with I always loved his character I actually believe it or not two of my favorite Marvel films are the t first two Captain America movies I liked the origin story and I really liked actually Winter Soldier is probably one of my favorite Marvel movies to date I actually really like the character and there's a moment where he uh, faces off against himself other than that I was completely lost when we got to the end of the movie and he shows up as his old version on the bench. Someone said that with one piece of dialogue, because it was, it was explained why that was, I didn't care, I was lost. I'm like, look, you just showed us a three hour movie of how you explained how they go into the past and how they do this. And then all of a sudden he comes back as an old man. Uh, huh? I was so lost, so I didn't buy it. And then giving the, sh the shield and, and the Captain America mantle onto Falcon, which I guess that's what's supposed to happen, right? In the comics, that kind of didn't make sense because again, they didn't spend a lot of time with those two characters in a weird way, enough for me to feel the weight of Falcon earning that mantle. Where in some ways I actually was like, well, what about Bucky? What's going, like, why isn't Bucky getting it? Because Bucky, like seemed to me like a much more of a, of a prominent character in the relationship with Steve Rogers. I don't know, I got lost and I just didn't buy like any of that kind of stuff. Thor channeling the dude, it got old real fast. I'm sorry, like it was kind of funny at first, like the first five minutes of the movie and then it just kept going and it just kept going and it just kept going and going. He's a bumbling idiot now and he's drunk all the time. And I, it's, it, was, it was an odd choice. The one thing I didn't like about the Hawkeye thing is even though I liked most of what he was in, I didn't like the Ronin, the backstory because they showed the one scene where he's fighting the one guy. And then they want us to think that he, he's been spending his whole life being a bad, kind of like a bad guy, like, like an assassin or a Ronin, whatever it is, Ronin. But I never really bought it. Like I was just like, well, you showed us one 
scene. The weight of it didn't work for me, especially when he was having his one-on-one -on -one with Black Widow, Natasha, during that fight scene when they were trying to scramble to see who would actually kill themselves, which still, is, that's a, it was such an odd scene for me. So that's it, that's Avengers. I'm sorry, if you guys if you guys enjoyed it, if you guys loved it, all the power to you. I'm happy for you. One of my, one of my good friends actually said she loved it because it was just, ex Total escapism for her. And then I've had some people who, who, who felt similar to what I did, but it's making a lot of money, very popular. I kind of see it as just the accumulation of a really well thought out plan of doing all of these movies as if it's its own serial. So I give props to Marvel, Kevin Feig, and all those, and the Russo brothers, and all those guys, and the whole cast. Well done. You know, that's no small feat, you know, what you guys did. I just wish Endgame was a better film for me personally. I wasn't really that satisfied with it. Anyway, let's go on to Q&A, shall we? All right, so I got my glasses on, I got my coffee. Oh yeah, I don't know if you guys noticed. Uh, I put my, dra my dragon earrings in today to celebrate Game of Thrones. I got these at Hot Topic like maybe like three or four years ago. Let's dive in. Mr. Muxix, your transition looks to be going really well. Hope it all goes smoothly. Thank you so much. I love it when you guys reach out and you tell me those things. Um, I'm super, super happy. I really am with my transition. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I feel and I look better than I thought I ever would. And today, believe it or not, my mom reached out to me. I completely forgot. I got my GCS surgery done three years ago today. It's kind of crazy. Like my life like is going so fast and there's so many things going on that I literally forgot today was my three year anniversary that I got that surgery. And my mom reached out to like basically say congrats and you need to celebrate and this is, you know, it's hot. So I'm like, thanks mom. Angel Tarragon, hi Miss Mako. I'm so happy that you are making these videos again. It really is a shot of positivity in my life. Your transition is coming along great and you look so beautiful. What advice do you have for trans folks dealing with cyber harassment and for those of us that are pre everything and don't know where to start? Okay, so cyber harassment exists. It's out there. I think I kind of had a head start in dealing with it, probably more so than most people, because of course I was, I was sharing and I was on the siren song and I was sharing artwork and there was comment sections and, and forums and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of got a taste of cyberbullying early on in, in my internet career. It, it hurt at first, but after a while, I just, I just realized I need to stop. I can't take this stuff personally because most of the people making comments at me, they don't, they know nothing about me. It's all very superficial. It's all it's kind of pro projection. After a while, that's kind of how I had to look at it. And hopefully most of you who, who deal with cyberbullying, you know, most of it comes from people we just don't know, right? They don't know us personally. They don't know on a daily basis what we have to deal with. So you kind of have to look at it that way as if like, you know what? They're projecting, they're the ones with the issues and they're just trying to take it out on some of us. As much as you can, try not to take it personally um, and try not to fuel it either. Don't always respond with the obvious kind of feedback or, or replies. A lot of times if I do reply, I'll, I'll reply with something that they weren't expecting. Cause I'll literally just respond back to it like, I love you, thank you, hugs. And they'll just be like, what? You're like, <laughs> it'd be kind of funny some of the comments that I get from that. In terms of the pre everything and don't know where to start, my advice to you is find a good therapist first, first and foremost, because I can only go off of what my own experience has been. And I started with a therapist and then I added on a psychiatrist soon after that. So I literally had two people that I would go to every week. And uh, it really, really helped because it really uh, brought up a lot of my past and all the things I've struggled with. It's amazing how much I suppressed throughout my life and how much guilt I kind of had because of the way I felt. So that's where I would start and then work with them to kind of first kind of get a diagnosis of what they think might be going on and then figure out a game plan as if you need to bring on a medical doctor especially an endocrinologist, someone who can help you. If you have been diagnosed properly, that can help you with the, the physical transition uh, in terms of possibly starting a, a hormone replacement um, regimen. So that's that's where I would begin, personally, is, is try to find a therapist. Especially someone, if you, look at, if you look up someone online that's like close to where you live, make sure they kind of have LGBT experience. Donna, I'm gonna call you Donna now. I don't know that I'm always gonna remember, but thank you for letting me know. When you're eating fresh pineapple, the pineapple is eating you too. There's an enzyme in the pineapple that actually breaks down protein. That is why your mouth and tongue get sore if you eat a lot of pineapple all at once. Well, thank you for that advice. Again, I love pineapple, so. This is how much I love pineapple. 
See, it's a whole pineapple. Natalie Rath, hey, you're looking great. Hope you are well. Lovely video as always. Enjoyed all your previous works. Thank you, Natalie. Moon Trail, congratulations to your daughter. I'm happy you get the joy of celebrating your daughter's transition to the next phase of her life. I know, it's kind of crazy. We just had a really, really good conversation the other night. I remember those days, right when I finished college and how nervous I was of like, oh my God, real life, now I have to do it. She's now dealing with that. Yeah. We'll see where she is, but I'm really proud of her. I'm really happy for her. She's a good kid. Oh, and she's been super supportive of me this whole entire time. In fact, probably one of my biggest cheerleaders. So she rocks my world. Orion Mustang, is there a way I can buy Eleven on DVD? If so, can you please give me a link? Thank you. Hmm. How should I answer this one, guys? Go to makeupictures.com slash DVD. Uh, Gamer Fox, please make more TG comics. Um, well, I think I've mentioned there is one in the works where I'm working with two other people. One is an artist. It's a story that I came up with. It's pretty complex. It's like as complex as Paradox Alice. So it's a pretty big project and we're currently in the beginning stages of it. We're working on it. Some uh, development stuff has been done on it. That's kind of it. That's what I'm doing right now. Ray even reached out to me today of all, of all days and asked if I might be interested in doing any more live action projects. And so I think we'll meet up, we'll talk, but I'm like, look, I'm in a completely different place in my life. I did a lot of this stuff because I was struggling with gender dysphoria. And ever since I've transitioned, like my gender, my gender dysphoria has disappeared. And now I'm just basically just a woman and I like that. And I am transgender too, but I'm, I'm primarily living my life 99% of the time out in the world as a woman. The Ratsmith, man, what a cliffhanger. I can't wait for the dramatic reading of 12. Ha <laughs> ha, funny. He's talking about the 11 reading from last week. Okay, Ross, I love your movies and I don't see you as transgender. I see you as a true woman and a director and very beautiful. Am I blushing? That's so sweet, thank you. John Awakens, Tales from the Underground, The Trap. Sinister reading, please. Ah, that would be funny. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know this, but, uh, and he called it right, like, The Trap, which is from the Tales from the Underground series that we did. The Trap is actually a sequel of sorts to Eleven, so the same characters are pretty much in it. Tess came back, she just happened to be in town, and so we got back together and we shot like a, a short. It basically is a sequel to Eleven. So. There is a part of Eleven that I think that actually still exists in uh, on my video channel and it's called The Trap. So go to Tales of the Underground, The Trap, and that is like a pseudo sequel to Eleven. Teal um, Hedgehog 25. Hi, Miss Mako. Good to see you. Hi. Very good to see you, Teal. Um, Paige Copley. Hi, Miss Mako. I'm a longtime watcher, first time caller. I agree it is trans ladies like you out there who inspire the everyday trans woman. I had trans influ influences in the 2000s who after a few years moved on to a stealth life and I'm very happy for them. However, you always felt like you had lost a friend when they disappeared and as people like you have stayed connected with us, all that continue to inspire and raise the flag for us all. I just want to add for years, I would watch both your comics videos and RD James videos also. And when I found out you were trans sometime after you had come out, I was blown away and a bit of me thought, hmm, Maybe you should have seen that coming. Anyhow, cheers for the video updates. Regards, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Yeah, um, I agree with you. Like, I, I think most trans people, especially trans women that I've known, they kind of go into stealth mode and they kind of disappear, right? And that's why it's so hard sometimes to kind of follow trans people after they've transitioned because you're like, well, where'd they go? And they're just, they're just trying to, you know, lead a normal life. And for the most part, that's kind of what I've done too, but I'm not stealth about it per se. Cause I'm obviously I'm open and I'm talking about it and I talk about it uh, in my personal life too. So I go to college campuses and I talk about it. I talk about it with people in the industry, the entertainment industry. So I'm not shy about it. I'm not afraid to, to bring it up. And yeah, and I think we kind of need that. I think, especially for some people out there who are still struggling with their gender dysphoria. I, it, I just remember being lost for most of my life, not feeling like I could connect to anybody and didn't feel like there was anybody out there that was like me for a really long time. We were lucky to some extent that we have a way now to reach one another and for me to do these videos in, in a way and just show you that there's all different even kinds of trans people and different kinds of trans women like me. Like I still consider myself to be kind of like the geeky, maybe more professional, geek professional trans woman. Hmm. 
Go figure. Yeah, and I agree. The other the other issue I've heard a lot in the community about trans people who have uh, started to transition, especially artists, is that the artists just kind of disappear. And I know there's some of you are probably kind of upset that like I'm not doing nearly what I used to with like the videos and the the comics and stuff like that. But I've heard a lot of complaints about that too. That like a lot most of the time when trans people come out and they start to transition, especially the artists type, they they tend to not produce any more stuff. Except there's a few like Clue Dog, I would say, still does it. So Louis Gondor, will you someday tell us something about your previous marriage and children situation went? I remember you saying you weren't ready to talk about it yet. Has that changed? You know, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this because so much of it is personal. But I will general some of the stuff for you since you've asked and it's been a while now. I have two kids. I have a daughter and I have a son. My daughter's like three years older than my son. And I was married for 20 years. Shocker. And my daughter was super, super supportive. Like I remember telling her on the beach and she, we both cried and she jumped on me and she grabbed me and she hugged me and she said, I love you and I will always be here for you. My ex-wife and my son weren't supportive. They had a really hard time with it. I think unfortunately what happened was they took it out on me. I ended up becoming the human punching bag. There were things that were said and there were things that were done to me that were really ugly. Like I would never wish on anybody in terms of things that were said and done and, and lies. I hate to say it, like there were there were lies. Trying to make me look bad in, in the eyes of others and it just didn't work because the majority of people around me, friends, family, work associates, all ended up kind of for the most part supporting me. And uh, unfortunately the other two were kind of more vindictive and they wanted me to pay the price for what I had done. So unfortunately the, what happens is a lot of, for a lot of us that come out, it's uh, you see everyone around you internalize your situation. It makes it about them. Literally everybody around me made it about them. Like my parents did, my friends did, like everybody kind of made it about them. Some of them just quickly switched over and said, well, I love you and I support you, but it still might have taken days, weeks, months. But the most severe of them all was basically my ex and my son. That being said, my son and I actually are on pretty good terms these days and I'm trying to help him out and he's apologized a lot and we we kind of actually have pretty good conversations and he, and he seems to be in a much better place. So he and I seem to be doing okay. Like we're, we're, we're kind of getting back into a, 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 a decent relationship. I went through so much trauma during those years with my ex and some of the things that happened that I'm not sure I could fully recover from that. I'm just gonna be honest. I, I don't know that I can ever forgive some of the things that happened. And that's just unfortunately a reality. And I, I've moved on from that, but I don't know that I can totally forgive because I think that there was some very inhumane stuff and I don't think it was fair, uh, especially when uh, I was so vulnerable in my life and trying to be sympathetic and empathetic in every with everybody around me at the same time that I was trying to take care of myself. That wasn't reciprocated and I was turned into a villain. Sometimes you lose people and in this in these particular situations and that's kind of what happened here. John Awakens, I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and I've been reading the new comic book series by Boom Studios. So far I've been enjoying it and rather support the comic than the reboot of the show. Like why reboot the show when the main character has a different race when instead they can make a spin-off show with a new slayer. Enough with the ranting a little. The character I relate to the most is Willow and I was wondering which character do you relate to the most? I think the obvious choice would be Willow for me because of the geekiness, but Buffy. I mean, <laughs> I do, I just, I always related to Buffy. I like, she's like a go, go at him, kick, kick ass kind of girl. And uh, and I took martial arts for three or four years. So it's like, I, I had my share of having to take down some people that were picking on me when I was younger. So yeah, I've always kind of associated myself with Buffy and kind of felt like I was more like her. But yeah, I also like Willow. I mean, there is a part of Willow. I mean, you probably look at me now and it's like, oh yeah, I'll probably look, you know, I seem more like Willow than I do Buffy, but I always kind of associated myself with Buffy. Uh, Teal Hedge, have you seen Avengers Endgame? Obviously I have, so I answered that question. John Awakens, good answers and good points. There's a lot that can go into a story, right? And kind of hard to pick a story you want to tell. Like I would like to write a, um, T 2F, horror story where it feels like two different people like Ben and Glory. Buffy the Vampire Slayer more set in a slasher genre. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, gosh, I mean, obviously I was very much into writing M2F horror stories. So, and I still get requests all the time, you know, from people asking me to, to, to attack so almost like fan fiction of some of their favorite stuff that's going on right now. Not Yen, let me be in your video, please. Which one? Are you talking about this one? Or are you talking about like, 
something else I might do. Jessica Michelle Todd, hi, it is one year since I started HRT. Congratulations, Jessica. I'm super, super happy for you. It's kind of amazing. Like HRT is like kind of like a magic potion. It doesn't necessarily always seem like it right away. And it takes a while to kind of realize like how much it really is changing your body. Hmm. I obviously don't have a problem up here. Let's face it. I just don't. And this is great. And this has turned turned out awesome. Like my face and stuff like that and my hair and almost every other part of my body, like I'm fairly happy with. The one area that I always kind of had an issue with was my hips and down in that area in terms of shape and form and stuff like that. But what's interesting is that I started taking HRT in 2014 and almost everything else kind of developed within the first couple of years, but I still like didn't really have any hips or any like kind of like thigh action or anything down there in my bottom region, right? But in the last year, like I've noticed like the muscles and the fat and stuff like that are starting to change down in that area. And I'm starting to look bigger. It's just amazing what HRT can do. It's like a magic potion. So congratulations, I'm happy for you. I'm I'm curious how you're gonna feel in about five to six years. Cause it kind of, unfortunately, sometimes I think it takes that long for certain things to happen. Cause it's like, you're going through a puberty again. And for a lot of people, it like takes like 10 years to like fully develop. Good luck and I'm happy for you. All right, so I have one question that actually came from Twitter this week. So just to let you guys know, I actually do have a, a Twitter account as well. So it's um, Miss Mako Dap, I think, on Twitter. Connor Chang actually sent me a question via Twitter. So Miss Mako Dap used to have the full movie of The Black Rabbit on YouTube, but it's disappeared around sometime last year when I never, I never figured out why. Can you explain why the movie was removed from YouTube? Okay, so really quick, there's probably been about three or four times since I've had YouTube where I've kind of made a lot of my videos go dark. And those were for personal reasons. So there, there was stuff going, there's been stuff that's been going on in my life where I've kind of had to go in and privatize them for various reasons. I can't give you specific as to why Black Rabbit right now, but that was definitely one of the ones that was privatized at the time, I think last year. And I just haven't brought it back publicly yet. Some of that actually has to do with, I think I was, I played the main character in it. I think at the time, like I was like, I need to privatize this video for right now. So there is a chance I'll bring it back online. In fact, I'll kind of look into it uh, in the next couple of weeks. And if I feel like it's safe to go ahead and put it back, I'll go ahead and make it public again. But yes, you're right. That's one of the ones I did, I did privatize and I don't think I've actually brought it back. Identity politics. So you've all heard of this, right? Identity politics, it gets brought up a lot. It, it now has, a, it used to have a positive connotation, now it has a negative. And real quick, the term identity politics in common usage refers to a tendency of people sharing a particular racial, religious, eth ethic, social, or cultural identity to form exclusive political alliances instead of engaging in traditional broad-based party politics. The term identity politics has been used in various forms since the 1960s or 70s but it has been applied with at times radically different meanings by different populations. So see the meaning changes. It has gained currency with the emergence of social movements such as the women's movement, the civil rights movement in the US, the LGBTQ movement, as well as nationalist and post-colonial movements. So why am I bringing up identity politics? Because I think it's really important that we all understand identity politics is being used, I actually think in not a good way anymore. I think it used to be used in a good way and now I don't. It's kind of like the idea of like political correctness like political correctness used to kind of mean something good. And then the right kind of took it and said, political correctness has run amok. I think the same thing here. Like I heard a lot, especially during the 2016 campaign about identity politics. And it's mostly comes from the right now as a negative connotation, especially from white straight Christians and evangelicals. The irony behind identity politics to me, is that identity politics ultimately encompasses everybody. So if you say you're a Christian and you're using that as a means to present yourself, that's identity politics. If you're a straight white man and you're presenting that, that's identity politics. If you're a transgender woman and you're saying like, you're talking about yourself and trying to like let people know who you are and what you have to deal with and the struggles that you might have, that's identity politics. And so I find it really interesting that the people who often see identity politics as a negative are the people in privilege. Privilege is a special right advantage or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. In sociology, privilege is the perceived rights or advantages that are assumed to be available only to a particular person or group of people. The term is commonly used in the context of social inequality, particularly in regard to age, disability, 
ethnic or racial category, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, and social class. So it all comes down to privilege. It all comes down to this idea that there are the people who normally have privilege when they when equality starts to happen, which happens when identity politics plays a bigger role in like everybody trying to become equal and have the same civil rights. The people who usually have the advantages and the privileges see that as oppression. And that's what we've seen going on. And I think that's why identity politics has become a bad word. Uh, to a lot of Republicans, conservatives, alt-right, uh, Christians, and evangelicals. And so I just wanted to throw that out to you guys because I don't like it when a political group hijacks a term and turns it into a bad thing. Uh, identity politics is important to someone like me or anyone in the LGBT community or even you know from a different uh, racial group, even women in general. And there's an attack right now, right, on a lot of minority groups and even women, just women in general. I mean, there's, gosh, there's like an abortion, a really strict abortion law that's like recoding what it means to have an abortion. He said say they're trying to get around the Supreme Court, uh, Roe versus Wade stuff in Georgia. And then one that just got dropped today in Alabama that looked like it was gonna go. So, and then there's the whole healthcare thing that came out last week where the Trump administration basically is making it easier for um, anyone to claim religious freedom to negate healthcare for anyone. But that primarily like it brings up LGBT people and even women when it comes to abortions. I bring that up because I had a situation when I went in for surgery, there was a nurse on staff who wouldn't help me and kept calling me a man, even though all of my identification, everything, I said I was Erica, said I was female, my gender marker, all that kind of stuff. I looked like a woman and all the other nurses were very pro. Like they were like, oh no, you need, and they were arguing with her. Like you need to help her. And she's a woman, you need to address her. And she's like, no, no, I don't have to do that at all. Now, of course she got written up and she got in trouble for that. However, with this new policy that Trump's administration, Trump and the administration and the GOP have basically are putting into place, she could actually get away with it and claim moral or religious freedom, which which is interesting because that is identity politics. Like if you claim that, isn't that identity politics? Anyway, I hope you guys have a good week. Send in the questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can via Twitter or YouTube channel. Oh, what we do in the shadows, if you haven't seen the TV show, watch it on FX. I highly recommend it. It's freaking funny and it's just as good as the actual movie, in my opinion. So take care, everybody. Bye. There's only one thing we say to death, not today.